You'll be turning your Bibles to the book of Judges, the fourth chapter. We will see the story of Deborah this evening, the fourth and fifth chapter. Are the story the same story actually if you think about it in the fourth chapter you have what would be the 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 prose what's called prose way of of explaining the story and then you have the poetry of the fifth chapter and it is the the poetry in the fifth chapter that really gives you more information and yet I want to keep them separate so that we don't bounce back and forth. But we, I'll have to probably kind of fill you in if you haven't studied it in, in a while on one or two things as we go through the fourth chapter. We'll find several different characters. We'll find Deborah, if you will. We'll also find Barak. We'll find a man by the name of Jabin and uh, Sisera, uh, to, to name the least. This is the time in which... Oh, yeah, I have something here. This is the time in which uh, Deborah is called upon by the children of Israel. Some, someone, let me back up for just a second. Someone was asking me last week. I know who it was, uh, but we won't call Jim's name. <laughs> but somebody was asking me last week about uh, how the judges overlap, and, and I made the statement that uh, sometimes the judges just were in – certain areas that that their leadership, I guess, is probably the best term to use. Their leadership was not over all of Israel at the same time. And I came across in Wilbur Field's book, um, Old Testament History, I came across two maps that are interesting that show the area in which these judges uh, took over. And so if you're interested, I ha you can have a copy but uh, there they are and so that kind of answers that question for us but anyway back to deborah we're ready for the fourth verse of the fourth chapter now to talk about this story it's it's interesting when you think about the bible and you think about and look at it from its gruesomeness this is a this is a gruesome story in many ways I've preached on it before, not here, but in other places. It's it's interesting, but yet at the same time, too, when you think about getting your head nailed to the wall, so to speak, or nailed to the floor, that's not fun. And yet that's what happens. Let's read the story. Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidus, Lapidus means torch, was judging Israel at that time. Now, remember, if you go back, we already looked at verses uh, 1, 2, and 3. In verse 3, the children of Israel cried out to the Lord for Jabin. Now, Jabin was, was a king, but he was king of Hazor, and evidently he was a, he was a tyrant, to say the least. They'd called out for a king, or excuse me, for a judge, for a, for a, a, a victor, for a champion. There's the word I'm looking for. And Deborah is the one that's going to answer that call. Notice that it says that she was judging Israel, and the word judging here has more of the sense of, of holding court than the champion that we've talked about uh, through already through two or three of the judges. That uh, Notice that verse 5, it says that she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. Then she sent and called for Barak, the son of ben Oam from Kadesh and Nephtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded, Go and deploy troops at Mount Tabor? Take with you 10,000 men of the sons of Nephtali and the sons of Zebulun, and against you I will deploy Sisera, commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude at the river Kishon, and I will deliver him into your hand." Deborah is called, and evidently is called by God, to go and to deliver, if you will, because that's, as we've talked about, the word judge means deliverer, champion, to deliver Israel from the hand of Jabin. Now, go back to, in case you kind of forgot, and go back to verse 3. The reason that the children of Israel were crying out is because Jabin, notice 
the army that he had, 900 chariots of iron, and he had 20 years that he harshly oppressed the children of Israel. They were ready to get rid of him. Deborah seems to be reluctant, if you will, in taking over. Now, you think about from a standpoint of culture of that time, women were not the leaders, and women didn't lead. And so from a cultural standpoint, it is really odd that God would choose, if you will, a woman to lead. And from that, we see as well her reluctance in that she she calls out. And notice, notice that it says that she sent and called for Barak. Barak is, is a, a Jewish general, and she calls for him to come and and sort of take over charge. And, and notice what she says. Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded go and deploy troops at Mount Tabor? She speaks, she speaks, if you will, what the Lord commanded. She's giving him a reminder almost of the revelation that God had given to them. And so she says, go, deploy, notice. With you, 10,000 men of the sons of Naphtali and the sons of Zabulon. And against you, I will deploy Sisera. Now, who was Sisera? Well, Sisera was the, the commander that was captain of Jabin's army, who was king of Hazor. This was a group that had come into Israel. This was a group that had come into a particular area, especially around the mountains of Ephraim. And as they had taken over, they, Jabin had sort of been the tyrant for 20 years. Children of Israel said no more. God says, go, go, I'll take care of you. Go and deploy against this, this um, terrible army. Go and, and deploy against Sisera and Jabin's army and all of his chariots. But notice, notice the promise of God, the very last phrase, if you will, of verse 7. This is still God's command, God's revelation, God's deployment, whatever you want to call it. Deborah's speech, if you will. I will, God's talking there, deliver him into your hand. The promise. Promise that we saw in the times of Joshua, remember? God says, you're going to get it. Well, here, Deborah reminding the Children of Israel, reminding especially, if you will, uh, Barak of, of what was going to happen. It says, don't you remember? God told you. We're going to win. We're going to win. And so Barak becomes reluctant in verse 8. And he said to her, if you'll go with me, then I'll go. But if you'll not go with me, I'll not go. Now, something to remember about Barak is where he is found in another place in the Bible. Do you remember where that might be? Hebrews 11, one of the heroes of faith. He sure is. But yet, he is reluctant to go even though God had commanded to go and even though God had told him, you'll win. His strength almost seems to come from the fact of, Deborah, if you go, I'll go. If you go, it'll be all right. But if you don't go, I'm not going to go. Sometimes some folks rely upon others, and they rely upon others completely for everything. Maybe this was Barak's problem. Maybe not. Maybe it was the fact that Barak was was an individual that he understood the order, at least for this fight, that Deborah was to lead. She said in verse 9, surely I'll go with you. Nevertheless, there'll be no glory for you in the journey that you're taking, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. In other words, she says, okay, Barak, I can go with you. But if I go with you 
and we win, nobody's going to pat you on the back. Nobody's going to say, man, he's the champion. He's the victor. They're going to say, look what Deborah did. And so she reminds him of this. And notice, notice then what happens. Deborah rose, went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh. He went up with 10,000 men under his command, and Deborah went up with him. 10,000 men, mighty force, to go against Jabin and, well, really not Jabin, but to go against Sisera and his men, men that were under the true leadership of Jabin, the king. And so they go. When you think about sort of what, if you will, Barak needed, he needed encouragement. He needed fellowship of Deborah. And when he gets that, he's willing to go. They call them for the soldiers to come. God, if you will, takes in many ways the weakest and the most unlikely of, of individuals to serve him and to fulfill his purpose. And then in verse 11, now Heber, excuse me, Heber, the, Can, the Can, Canaanite, or Can, Kenite, excuse me, I'll get it right in a minute, the Kenite. The Kenites were neighbors, if you will. And so Heber, the Kenite of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had separated himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent near the Terebinth tree at Zanum, which is beside Kadesh. And they reported to Sisera that Barak, the son of Benom, had gone up to Mount Tabor. So Sisera gathered together all of his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the people who were with him for uh, Herod, Seth, and Haggim to the river Kishon. So you see his strategy. We're going to get him. We're going to circle him. We're going to find him, and we're going to take care of all of it. Deborah then said in verse 14 to Barak, Up, for this is the day which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand. Has not the Lord gone out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. I want you to notice something. Look in verse 14. She tells Barak, get up. This is the day. But notice what she says, which the Lord has delivered. There's three times in what follows in which God's hand is given the distinction of being the reason for the victory. Now, that is something that we should appreciate. That's something that we should say, okay, she understood the order of things. Deborah understood this was not her, this was not Barak, this was the hand of God. That God was with them, that God was going to use them to gain the victory that was needed to help Israel. And so God, like we say, God uses, uses his people for his purpose, for his good. And so granted now he is using all the children of Israel, or not all the children of Israel, but those from Zebulon and Nephtali that had come to fight the fight. And then verse 15, the Lord routed Sisera and all of his chariots and all of his men with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. Now, here's where I need to throw in in uh, the fifth chapter, in the poem, if you will, that we'll see in the fifth chapter, that is Deborah's. One of the things we find out is, is that evidently there came a terrible torrential rain. And that rain then would have created what? Mud. And mud does what to chariots? Yeah, you can't get anywhere. And so this is how Deborah says God defeated, if you will, Sisera. Because Sisera loses. Sisera is is uh, Hazor, or is from Hazor, is Jacob's, remember, general. And so 
we look at this and we say, man, with all of the firepower that he had, how could he lose? Well, Deborah answers that for us in the next chapter, and we'll we'll talk about that a little bit more. But notice that Sisera gets off. Barak pursued the chariots in the army as far as, as uh, Herosheth, Haggim, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left except who ran away. Go back and look what it says. Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. So Sisera runs away. However, verse 17, Sisera had fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Canaanite. For there was peace between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the house of Heber, the Canaanite. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, do not fear. And when he had turned aside with her into the tent, she covered him with a blanket. We look at that and we say, hmm, that's interesting. Sisera is running away. He's running by foot. He gets, if you will, he gets to this lady. And here's what she says. Come on into my tent. And we look at that and we say, well, no, no. But there were others. Genesis 31 we see a time in which men entered the tent of ladies. And so we look at that and we say, well, you know, that's terrible. He shouldn't have done that. That breaks custom, breaks protocol. Evidently, it was something that was done from time to time, and especially here in a time of need, in a time to hide out, in a time for Sisera to hide out. And so when Jael went out, to meet Sisera, she begged him, turn aside, come on in, don't be afraid. Now, this was in many ways a ploy. She covers him, she covers him, it says, with a blanket. Some other versions have something different. Rug. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's an ambiguous term. Uh, some sort of covering. I think would be to kind of get it in your mind would probably be the best way of looking at it. And so he thinks he's hidden. He's exhausted. He's exhausted from fighting. He's exhausting, exhausted because he's been running probably in mud as well. He's exhausted from everything that's gone on, but he's willing to take, this individual, at her word, he's willing to take her comfort, her hospitality, the opening within the tent, and the fact that she was going to hide him. But he goes on to ask for something. And so Sisera asked Hill, he said, please give me a little water to drink, for I'm thirsty. Well, she being a good hostess, went a little bit beyond what he asked. Notice what she did. She opened a jug of milk and gave him a drink and covered him up. She showed hospitality to him. Okay, he wants a little water. Well, here, we, we give him a little milk. It's interesting because in the fifth chapter, uh, Deborah will talk about she gave him cream. And so she gave him this and then covered him up. And, of course, he would drift off to sleep. He said to her, stand at the door of the tent. And if a man comes and inquires of you and says, is there any man here? You shall say no. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple and went down to the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary. She knew how to handle a tent peg, and probably did, because one of the, the tasks of the women were to set up the tents. 
Oh, oh, oh. I didn't think about that as I said. <laughs> See if you can talk Diane into that. <laughs> Yeah, you might. You might. So there's a trade off there. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But so uh, she would be accustomed, you know, to driving a peg in. But think about this. Sisera thinks he's find, found comfort, thinks he's fi- found, I can't say it, found safety, thinks he's found a friend, an ally. Someone that he can trust, someone that's going to take care of him, going to hide him. And he's even set it up. You stay at the tent, you stay guard. Somebody comes up, says, There's a man in the tent, you say no. He thought he had it fixed up. You might say, Well, the great lesson to learn there is you can't trust anybody. Well, there is a lesson there to learn that you better be careful who you trust. And so, you know. Growing up, I often heard, I'm going to nail your britches to the wall. Uh, this is a case where a man's head was nailed to the floor, nailed to the ground. It's just, it's gruesome, you know, if you think about it. It's interesting how that the victories, some of the victories in the book of Judges uses something so small. Remember Shamgar's Ox goad we talked about last week and the victory that he had, just an eight-foot-long pole that had a pointed end on one end and a small scoop of a shovel on the other end. Think about, think about uh, this time, the tent peg. You know, wooden peg, uh, who knows? We really don't know how big they were, but they're not huge. And yet she kills him. And then, as Barak, food Sisera, Jael came out to meet him. <laughs> and when Jael gets, oh, excuse me, when uh, Barak gets there, Jael tells him, well, come on in. And I will show you the man whom you seek. Now, we don't really know how she knew that Barak was, was trying to find Jael, or excuse me, Sisera. More than likely, more than likely, Jael, being a friend of the Israelites, understood Sisera was their enemy. Somehow that was noted. And so she tells Barak, who had been chasing Sisera, come on in and I'll show you the man that you seek. And when he went into her tent, there lay Sisera dead with peg in his temple. So on that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, in the presence of the children of Israel. And the hand of the children of Israel grew stronger and stronger against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. So God gave them a victory. They were able to overthrow they were able to overthrow Jabin. They were able to, to take him over. Notice that it says that the hand of the children of Israel grew stronger and stronger against this king until finally they defeated him. So peace and strength, change in society for the better, all came about for victory. Now, there's a lot of lessons to learn, but I want us to get into the fifth chapter and look at it because it is a rehashing in many ways, but an explanation of the fourth chapter. And after we get through with it, we'll get lessons from the story. Any questions, comments, thoughts, suggestions? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Not that I know of. She was she would have been chosen by God. Of course, prophetess 
prophetess is just one who speaks for. The word, the word prophet, there are three Hebrew words. Nabing, Roeh, and I can't think of the third one off the top of my head. But they, they have the idea of one who speaks for another. And so she was a speaker for another. So at this point, she was a speaker for God. At other times, could she have been? Yes. Uh, did that make her a leader? It made her one that people would look to. And so is that the reason that God rose her up as the judge, as the champion? I don't know. I don't know. We don't have really an, an insight. It's a good question. I just I don't know. The inside. I do know we have to be very careful because there are those, there are some, you don't find this argument a lot, but you find it some that want to use women as in leadership roles in the church today. They point to Deborah and say, well, she was, she was a prophetess. She was a leader in the church. And so we can use women today, but there's not, there's not any, you can't equate one with the other. And, uh, you know, what did she lead in? What was she a prop? Who was she a prophetess to? We don't know. And did she lead a, in any way, a public assembly it doesn't say. So it's a, it's a poor argument. It's not used often, but it is used every once in a while. But uh, Jay, from a standpoint of just answering your question point blank, I don't have the answer. I don't know. Somebody else may know. I don't think the that to my knowledge, there's not a, a there's not a reason given. If you go back to Judges chapter two, it talks about the qual the, the 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 fact that they would rise champions, would raise champions, and what they would do, but not necessarily their qualifications of what they had to be like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but it was calling for whatever she had to go. Yeah. In that face right. Yeah. Yeah. She, she traveled. Yeah. We, uh, Locations are very hard to, to pinpoint, and, and if we don't all have a map in front of us. But, yes, it's a distance. It's uh, She was south, and she's traveling north. Anything else? It's all good. Well, now we have poetry in the book of Judges. And I don't know. I was thinking about this today. I thought, you know, all through school, especially high school, uh, you had poetry and you had to study poetry. And you had to read poetry and I had to read it and study it just like you did. And, and I didn't get very far in reading and studying poetry. All the, the little nuances and the, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of these straight ahead facts type of guy. And so when I, I read this again this morning, just read it through right quickly. I thought, huh? And then I begin to look at it, and it does make a lot of sense. But it, it is interesting. Now, one of the things that I thought was interesting that, that I didn't know, but I was reading some other individuals, and uh, one in, one particular Harold Shanks commentary in Truth for Today commentary series, he he made a, a point that I have found to be true, and uh, I thought it was interesting. I will share it with you, and that is that in this chapter there are some Hebrew terms that this is the only place in the Bible that they're used. And so they're obscure from the standpoint of what we know about them, and the exact translation of them is in question. Now, I'm not questioning, I'm not questioning, no, don't, don't misunderstand it. I'm not questioning the inspiration of this. I'm not questioning whether this was actually from Deborah. I'm questioning our understanding of it from, from the standpoint that some of these words that are so obscure can be, can be taken differently 
and depending upon how you look at them, given different meanings. And so when you pull out several different versions of the Bible, you get really different looks at some thoughts in this poem, for lack of a better term. And so you say, well, who's right and who's wrong? Well, we we really don't know because the words are so obscure and they're not used in other places. And so, so I just say that to say this. Uh, I'm going to read out of the New King James. You may be reading out of something else. And you might say, well, that word does not match at all with the thought that you read that you're reading in a different version. It's because of the, the obscurity of the words that make for ambiguity. But it is to say, and I'm, like I say, I'm not questioning the, the, the story. I'm not questioning the, the authenticity of the story. I'm just saying that if you go home, sit down, and let's just say pull out the New King James and pull out the American Standard, and let's say you pull out the, the ESV and you pull out the Revised Standard, you're going to get a difference in some places. Not every place, but in some places. So, so just in case you do that, you understand why. Well, let's read this. Deborah and Barak, the son of Benham, Sang on that day, saying. Now, the word sang here is interesting. We don't, in the English language, except for like he and she, our verbs especially are not thought of as masculine or feminine. In Hebrew, and in, especially in Greek too, there is a difference. And it's interesting that when it uses the word sang here in verse one, it's in the feminine, which would lead you to believe. And this, you know, you can take this for whatever it's worth, but it would lead you to believe that Deborah was actually the one saying this. Not so much Barak. I know it says then David, Deborah and Barak some sang, and maybe they both did, but it would lead you to believe by the fact that it's a feminine verb that maybe Deborah uh, said this or sang this poem. Let's begin. When leaders lead in Israel, leaders must lead. That, that is just interesting to me. When leaders lead in Israel, it would almost imply what? That there were times in which their leaders didn't what? didn't lead. That may be very true, because remember, we've talked about these seven cycles that are in this book of sin and, and servitude and, and seeking God and then the salvation of God, if you will, uh, that circle of, of apostasy that, that occur, occurs seven times in this book of Judges. And that each time when they're, they sin and they're in servitude and they, they, they cry out for God, God raises that champion and delivers them back. And then there's the, that good time. Well, it may be during those failing times that leaders weren't leading. And Deborah says, look, we experienced this by the fact that Jabin has come in. You know, some of our folks have not listened and some of our folks have, have turned away. And so our leaders didn't lead. But then she goes on to say, when the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. And she's going to tell you, leaders didn't lead, but the, the, there are people that stood up. There are people that willingly volunteered themselves to overcome the enemy. Hear, O kings. Give ear, O princes. In other words, let me have your attention. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will sing praises to the Lord God of Israel. I'm going to sing, and I'm going to praise his name because we already know the story. The story just happened. Uh, that Jabin and, and all of his cohorts are overcome. That Israel has gained their strength. They've gained their peace. And so she says, I'm going to sing praises to the Lord. Lord, Verse 4, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens poured 
The clouds also poured water. The mountains gushed before the Lord. This Sinai, before the Lord God of Israel, it rained. And it wasn't just a little rain. Remember back in our topical study, right before we came back to the book of, of Judges, in our topical study, we talked about one of the first lessons in ba biblical backgrounds. We talked about the land. And we talked about the topography. We talked about how that there were mountains in Israel. A mountain range runs almost through the middle of it, north to south or south to north, whichever direction you want to go. We talked about how that, that uh, the winds, the prevailing winds that would come off the ocean sometimes would hit those and rattle, it, rattle around in those mountains. And we talked about the, the rains and the how that they would be a torrential and how that they they would rain and, and it would catch the the rain from that standpoint of course and it would flow down the mountains it's sort of like um i've lived in middle tennessee since 1995 before that i was in West Tennessee, and then lived for a little while in West Kentucky. But I grew up in West Tennessee. We don't have hills. We have rolling areas, and we have ditches. It's interesting. You come to Middle Tennessee, you have creeks and hills, right? <laughs> you have mountains in East Tennessee. You have hills in Middle Tennessee, and you have just rolling land and ditches in West Tennessee. When it rains, it kind of just sets in one place in Middle Tennessee where I grew up. I had to get used to, to the hills of, of Middle Tennessee when it rained. You know, the water's going to run. It's going to run, of course, to the place of least resistance. Well, notice, notice this poem. The earth trembled. The heavens poured. Clouds poured. Water. Mountains gushed. So it was torrential. In the days of Shamgar, son of Nath, in the days of Jael, the highways were deserted. The travelers walked along the path byways. Village life ceased. It ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose. Here's the deliverer. We've had problems. We had folks that the highways became deserted. The travelers walked. In other words, folks didn't trust anybody and there was great oppression. But I arose, a mother in Israel. They chose new gods. Then there was war in the gates. Notice that she attributes part of their fall here in verse 8 to their new gods, little g, not God Almighty, but little gods. These were, these were, excuse me, then there was war in the gates. That tells you something about where the war was. This was a very much an agrarian society. But the cities, remember, we talked about when we talked about biblical backgrounds, we talked about the cities being city states and they all had walls around them. OK, so the wars that were fought out in the fields have now come to the gates. They've come to the city where the people are. And there's fighting in the gates. Sure. sure. There you go. There you go. There's your answer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Anything else? Not a shield or a spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. Israel was ill-equipped to fight. Deborah says here, now, now you got to remember, we've already seen the story. We know the ending. But this is the beginning of the story that we talked about in the last chapter. Children of Israel wandering around. 
we need we need to get rid of Jabin. We need to get rid of Sisera. We need to get rid of all these terrible people that have come into our land trying to, to take us over and have treated us miserably. We need to, to put them in their place. We need to run them out. And so Deborah says, you know, okay, we took it. The battle came to the city, and yet we didn't have anything to fight with. Didn't have a spear, didn't have a shield. My heart, verse 9, is with the rulers of Israel who offered themselves willingly with the people. Bless the Lord. Speak. Verse 10 says, somebody, version have the word complain. There's a thought there that that might be the word. But anyway, speak. You who ride on white donkeys, who sit in judges' attire, and who walk along the road, far from the noise of the archers among the watering places, there they shall recount the righteous acts of the Lord, the righteous acts for his villagers in Israel. Then the people of the Lord shall go down to the gates. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake. Sing a song, arise, Barak, and lead your captives away, O son of Benoam. So we have a, a revival call. In other words, here we are. We had all these folks. We had, notice what she talks about. Speak, those who ride on white donkeys, you sit in judges attire. You folks that should have been leading that weren't leading. And so she says, here came a call. Awake. And then the survivors came down and the people against the nobles. The Lord came down for me against the mighty. From Ephraim were, the, were those whose roots were in Amalek. After you, Benjamin, now Benjamin is south of Ephraim, with your peoples from Make, Maker, rulers came down. These are the, the sons of, of Manasseh. And from Zebulon, those who bear the recruiter staff. So North Manasseh. In other words, here's 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 the fact. People were gathered around, coming around from Zebulun, coming around from Naphtali, as we talked about in the, the fourth chapter. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah. As Issachar, so was Barak, sent to the valley under his command among the divisions of Reuben. There were great resolves of heart. There was a rallying cry. These folks began to rise. Soldiers began to rise. And notice what she says in the last part of verse 15. There was great resolves of heart. They were ready to go. We understand what we're about to face. We understand the timing. We understand the situation. We understand what's going on. And we're ready to get going. And so, questions asked in verse 16, why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear the pipings of the flock? In other words, are you just among the people listening to them? Have you grown complacent in the idea that you don't want to get up and get going? Have you grown satisfied where you are and are not willing to get up and defend what you have? That's an interesting thought. Verse 17, Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan, and why did Dan remain on ships or at ease? Asher continued at the seashore and stayed by his inlets. Zebulun is a people who jeopardized their lives to the point of death. Naphtali also on the heights of the battlefield. There was self-sacrifice. Some were sitting and doing nothing, and some were giving everything they could give. They were giving themselves. Reminds us, doesn't it? of the church in many ways. 10% of your congregation usually does 90% of your work in a congregation. Always has been. Doesn't have to be, but it always has been. In that day, Deborah says, there were those that sat around and did nothing, but then there were those that were willing to die even for the cause. Now, we're going to have to stop right there. Unfortunately, I was really trying to hustle, trying to get through tonight, and I didn't make it. So I'm going to ask you to kind of next week, for next week, kind of skim over that again, kind of as a 
as a reminder before you get to class. And I'll kind of go back over it for you as a review. But we will pick up with verse 19, go through verse 31, and we will look at some lessons that we can learn. And then uh, we'll, we'll get to the next judge, and that will take three chapters. So it'll take a couple of weeks to study as well. And uh, as we continue, Israel's dealings with God and themselves and, and how they are. Anything else? Let's bow forward in prayer. Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day, thankful for the opportunity that we've had to study your word, thankful for your word and what it means to us, thankful for the opportunity that is ours uh, this evening to, to learn, to learn from this great story and to learn how that some gave all while others really didn't, and that we as Christians really need to be the ones that, that can put ourselves out there for you. And we ask that you watch over those that were mentioned a while ago in the announcements, be with them and bless them. Be with us the rest of this week, that we may be shining examples and lights to those that we come in contact with. Watch over us, bless us, and keep us. Forgive us of our sins, for this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Have a great week.